Welcome to today's research talk. Our speaker today is Rosario Gennaro. Rosario received his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1996 and was a researcher at the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center before joining the City College of New York, where he has served as the director for the Center for Algorithms and Interactive Scientific Software. Rosario is currently a research scientist in Protocol Labs' CryptoNet Lab. His research focuses on cryptography and network security, and more generally on theoretical computer science. His talk today is a survey of rational proofs. Rosario, thanks for joining us. It's great to have you. Uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm on leave this, this year from CUNY, and I'm very, uh, I'm really enjoying my time at Proto Lab so far. And uh, um, this is work that I've done before coming here. It's not work that it's currently done at Proto Labs, but uh, um, that may change. And so, let, let's start uh, from the very beginning, so what are proofs? So proofs are ways to verify as mathematical st statements. Um, you can think of it as there's a proof, prover, there's a verifier, the prover sends a string, which is a proof, and the verifier either accepts or rejects if according to a set of verification instruction. And the, for concreteness, we're gonna think of our mathematical statement to be of the form y equal f of x, where um, f is some function that it's being computed. If you think about a theorem uh, in more mathematical sense, then y would be either zero or one, and that would be the truth of a, of a, particular, of a particular mathematical theorem. Um, in a computational world where the verifier is an efficient algorithm, this corresponds to the class uh, NP of decision problems, which means um, the proof may be hard to find, but it's somehow um, there is an efficient algorithm that can verify uh, if the proof is correct or not. Um, to somehow generalize this notion, in back in the 80s, uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff in, um, introduced the notion of interactive proofs. In this case, uh, the two parties, they're, they're not just, there's not just a one uh, shot uh, message that contains the proof and a verification algorithm, but it's more a conversation in which the prover says something, the verifier asks questions, the prover answers based on that answer, the, the verifier asks more questions, and at the end, the verifier accepts or reject. And apart from adding interaction, a crucial uh, tool that uh, interactive proofs introduced was also the use of, of randomization. And in this case, we are okay, you know, sort of as borrowing a page from the randomized algorithm uh, theory in which you accept something, for example, being a prime, even if it's a composite with a very small probability, here we're going to accept false theorems um, with a probability that can be made arbitrarily small. So at the end of this process, if the theorem is true, the prover will always uh, prove, be able to convince the verifier of the correct statement. If the theorem is false, there is no proving strategy that can convince the verifier except with a very small probability. Um, then there was this interesting concept of zero knowledge, which I'm sure many of you know about, which we're not really going to cover much in this talk, but by adding interaction and randomization, is it even possible for the prover to convince the verifier of um, the truth of the mathematical statement alone without any other information uh, at all? So in particular, what about a, a proof of, of this fact? Um, or a witness of this fact. And a very remarkable um, result uh, of the early 90s was that the class of problems that you can actually handle in this setting is actually very large. Um, a polynomial time verifier can be convinced of the truth of a very, very large computation, in particular of a, of a computation that sits in p-space, which we, be, we believe to be much, much larger uh, than NP. Um, and so a computation for which 
there is no polynomial, at least we believe that there is no large uh, um, polynomial size uh, string proof that can be sent to the verifier. Um, there can be, sorry, there is a, such, a, such a proof, but it's not a um, polynomial time to, to verify. So, um, following the, the, the notion of interactive proofs, the uh, Brassard and al came up with this idea of, well, it's true that no efficient prover can convince the verifier of a, small, of a false statement, but um, what about if the prover is polynomial time, can we somehow um, limit the, the soundness to only efficient provers? Because in reality, uh, you know, everybody is an efficient polynomial time machine. So the, the difference between a proof and an argument in, in this context, and, and I'm going pretty fast here because I assume a lot of the audience uh, knows this, but if you don't, uh, stop me and ask me questions. But um, so in this case, we, so for proof, there is no strategy that can convince a verifier of a false statement, except with very small probability. In arguments, there could be such a strategy, but it's infeasible to, uh, to come up with it. And the way you can think of it is that there is a, um, the, the protocol somehow use cryptography to prevent uh, the prover from cheating. So the prover, in order to cheat, the prover would have to break some encryption scheme or some commitment scheme or some well-defined uh, computationally hard problem. So what, when interactive proofs and interactive argument were introduced, they were really talking about a, an all-powerful prover. Um, so interactive proofs were specifically about an all-powerful prover that was trying to convince a, you know, a small polynomial time verifier. Then you know, um, we came up with arguments with which the, pro the prover was also a polynomial time but somehow had more knowledge, more information than, than the verifier and was able to convince the verifier of the truth of the statement. But we were, all, we were still stuck in this notion of polynomial versus uh, super polynomial. But in reality, the complexity can be scaled down, right? And so you can think of this game of proving and verifier where the proof with an imbalance of power between the prover and the verifier to even inside the, the, the class of polynomially computable functions. So say that you are computing a function that takes a, some, a certain amount of cost. And in the rest of the talk, I will be using purpose with, with, on purpose the, the notion cost, because I don't want to be limited to the notion of running time. Um, so, and in, so I'm going to be more generic. So you compute a certain, uh, uh, you perform a certain computation that takes a certain amount of resources. Um, and then you would like to convince somebody who does not have those resources that the, um, that the result is true. So we can have, um, and this actually is the way a lot of these proofs run in practice uh, in, in a lot of the blockchain applications that we're seeing right now. The computation is actually polynomial time, but you, it's, it's a large uh, computation and you don't want the verification to expend all those resources because otherwise the, the system will scale. So, so this is basically the, the setup for the talk. And the last thing that I want to say is how do we compare proofs? What makes, you know, like the same way in which we in theoretical computer science, we like to compare algorithms, you know, like uh, one makes an algorithm better than another, one makes a proof system better than another proof system. And there are several parameters, several uh, directions on axis on which you can um, evaluate proofs. One of them is complexity. So if you're computing uh, a function that, that requires cost C, what is the overhead to compute that function together with the proof? Um, so what is the complexity of verifying the proof? That you, as, as I said, I, we want 
to be much smaller than, than the cost to do the computation. How much interaction do you need? Um, what are the computational assumptions that you're using or the computational setup model that you're using in order to prevent cheating from, from the prover? And you know, what is the bandwidth? How much communication are you using to, to uh, convince um, the verifier of the truth of such a statement? And, and the reality is, and again, this is, I assume a lot of people in the audience know about this, is that we actually got pretty good at this stuff. Um, in fact, the state of the art is, um, is something called SNARKs, which stands for succinct, in which uh, you, you send a, a proof which is very short. Usually, we, by short, we mean sublinear in the size of the statement that you're proving. The verification time is small. Um, we even got down to constant on the things. Um, so the verification time for much larger computation, we want it to be sublinear in the size of the computation or uh, ideally constant. We can do this non-interactively. We, we're back to the, con the concept of just a single message from the prover to the verifier. Sometimes we assume a setup model in which there is a trusted setup that happens before, there's some pre-processing that happens before, but the actual uh, act of proving is a single message. Um, the A stands for argument, which, you know, uh, again, in, in reality, if we believe our cryptographic assumption, it's good enough. And then um, the K stands for knowledge, in which we're not just proving that, um, a certain mathematical statement is true, but also that the prover knows uh, why it's true or proof of the statement or, or just a, a particular secret value that uh, the prover claims to know. And in theory, um, we know how to prove the correctness of any NP computation this way, right? Um, and in theory, it's actually amazing how theory has been moving really fast into practice in this area and how things that maybe 10 years ago we didn't think they would scale are now running on, on the blockchain uh, and they're, they're being run. You know, actually I was just earlier today on, um, on Twitter, I was seeing some, something about the, um, the, um, keynote at the mainnet conference where they were saying the blockchain application has been a, 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 been a great motivation to make this thing uh, scale and to pro productize, put, put this stuff into products. So there's still a lot, a lot of work to do to be fully, um, um, like there's still, you know, if I give you a, algorithm, there's still lots of work to do to magically map it into, into a proof, but the, 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 the gap between theory and practice has been getting much, much uh, narrow in the last few years. So we're pretty good. And so what, what is the question here, right? What, what are we looking at? So in this talk, we're going to look at a different um, kind of assumption on the prover. So remember, interactive proofs, the prover can be infinitely powerful, and the proof system is built in a way that the prover will still not be able to cheat unless it's extremely lucky. Then there then came arguments in which the prover is computationally bounded. So he's either, if he, if he wants to cheat, he's either incredibly lucky or incredibly powerful in in which he has to break some uh, believed computational assumptions, so like factoring large numbers or um, solving some, uh, inverting some hash function and so on. In this talk, we're going to talk about a third possible approach, which um, we're going to call rational proofs. We, in, in this case, there, there are computationally feasible cheating strategies. The prover could, if they wanted, um, prove a false theorem, but the prover is not going to have any interest in doing so. The prover is not incentivized. There's, there are incentives in the protocol that will push the prover to B 
behave honestly and only prove um, uh, true statements. And this notion of incentives, this notion of motivation, motivation assumed the existence of some sort of uh, reward utility function that we assume that the only goal of the prover is to maximize this uh, gain of this utility function at the end of the protocol. So think of it as the prover is going to be paid for the service. And what you want to make sure is that the prover, so and what you're gonna use as an assumption is that the prover is only interested to maximize his gains, their gains. So, so, the first paper, and I'm sure that, and here maybe people know of other uh, things that, uh, previous papers than this one, but the first paper that I am aware of that looked at this kind of problems is this paper by uh, Mira Belenki and al in 2008, where they use these notions of rewards and penalties. So let's assume that, the, that there's a prover that is tasked with computing an expensive function f on many inputs, okay? So the verifier needs, and then so the prover computes the function, computes yi equal f of xi, and the verifier receives these values and wants to check that the values are correct, right? And the, the function is too expensive for the verifier to compute on its own. So, what the verifier also, and the reason, one reason is that the verifier is also going to pay the prover for this correct computation. Think of it as a, the prover being Amazon Web Services, right? So, these, so the way they sort of came up with this, uh, their system was that you're going to take some of these computations, a random subset of them, and you're going to compute them again and check that the result is correct. And so this recomputation to verify the result is that either by the verifier or by other independent proofs. So you can think of this check in two ways. Either the verifier will take a random subsets of this XIs and recompute the function themselves and check, and if there is a problem, then something happens, and I'll tell you in a minute what happens. Or the verifier asks several provers to compute the same function on the same input like several times, and then the verifier, if there's a discrepancy, uh, will take the appropriate action. And what is this appropriate action? Is that wrong results, so correct computation are wrong results are penalized and parties that catch others cheating also get rewarded through some bounties. So, and the whole work in the paper was to analyze how to set rewards, penalty, bounties, and uh, the probability of checking computation. And at the end, they proved theorems that if you set your parameters this way, the prover will be incentivized to uh, honest behavior because it will maximize uh, if it cheats the the penalties are going to be um, somehow uh, eating it into its its gain and therefore rational prover will um, will always perform honestly. Um, there are some limitations to this approach. Um, that the first one is that you can only do deterministic computations because you're, you check by recomputing, right? You cannot do a problem in NP in which the prover says this thing is, this, this value is correct because I know something that, um, that the, the input to the, com the computation has to be public. There is no secret component to this, the, the, the secret witness then that the prover can prove that uh, makes the computation correct. And the other thing um, is that it does require an expensive verification. Even if you're doing only a subset of the, of the computations, uh, the function f might be, must be computed and 
the verifier might not have enough the resources even to compute the function at once. So those are the limitations of this approach. And I don't, I didn't see anything else in this area until a few years later, Azar and Mikali came up with this uh, notion of rational proofs based on scoring rules. And let me step back a little bit out of the rational proof uh, discussion to tell you what scoring rules are. Um, let's assume that a party, which I'm going to call the prover right now, uh, but doesn't have to, in the case of scoring rules, it doesn't have to be a prover, it would be the prover in our protocols. Um, but there's a party who knows a certain distribution over some data, right? So there's some data here and I know what is the distribution that this data follows. And I'm going to tell you that this is the distribution over the data. And, the, but I may tell you a different distribution. And as, what we would like to do is to incentivize the prover to tell me the truth, to tell me the correct distribution of our data. So, and the way we're going to do this, so you're going to tell me that this data, think of it, this actually is going to work later. So we have a bunch of, we have a vector of bits, and you're going to tell me that in reality, 75% of the bits are one. But in, in you're going to tell me that only 40% of the bits are one. And how am I going to check? I could read the entire vector, but I don't want to. So I'm just going to sample a bit at random. And um, let's call it x. So I'm going to sample one of this data. And, um, and then I'm going to use what's called a scoring rule, a function s, on the, and this is a function that depends on the distribution and on, the, on my actual sample. And the crucial properties of scoring rules is that if I'm going to announce a distribution, which is not the correct one, the expected value of the scoring rule so look, look at here. So this expectation is taken over the real distribution, okay? So when I sample X, the, this is what the expected value of the scoring rule because X follows the real distribution D, right? But the scoring rule is computed over what the prover told me the real distribution is, right? Well, it turns out that a scoring rule is strict and a real a strict scoring rule if this expectation is always maximized when the first input of the, of the scoring rule is the real distribution. Okay, so this is, this is a very important concept, a scoring rule, and this is something that was used in economics. The, Azar Mikhali did not introduce this. It was used in economics. It was used in uh, weather forecasting systems. Um, to sort of reinforce, it's almost like a, a reinforcing learning um, tool. So a scoring rule, if I tell you the correct distribution, I will maximize the value of SDX in expectation. While with, a, with an incorrect distribution, the, the expected value of the scoring rule will be smaller. So, Okay, that's basically what I just said in words. So the expectation of SD prime X is always smaller than that of SDX, and the expectation is taken over the correct distribution. So there, there it is. There's my incentive to incentivize the prover to announce the real distribution. I'm going to pay the prover with the value SD prime X. In expectation, if the prover tells me the right value, the right distribution, in expectation, they will be paid more than if they announce an incorrect value, okay? Do script scoring rules exist? Well, actually they do exist, and there are a few examples. The one that um, was chosen in the Azar Mikali paper is called the Briars rule, 
which uh, works as follows. So if I sample X and you tell me that the distribution is D, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I'm gonna use this formula to compute the, so this is the, the weight of X according to the distribution D. So for example, if in the example that I said before, which will come back in the next slide, if you tell me that is only 40% of, um, um, if you tell me that there's only 40% of one bits, then this is uh, 4 10. The probability, if I sample a one, D of X is, is 4 10. Um, in, and if I sample at zero, that would be 6 10. Uh, this value right here. And so this is, and you, you, it's not difficult to prove that this function right here, when you take the expectation of a different distribution is maximized when this D and this D prime are the same. I'll leave it to you as an exercise. Um, so, but believe me, trust me, that that's actually the case. So, um, by the way, I'm not following the chat. Uh, okay. Is it still distant? Oh, okay. So no, it's, it's fine. That was just a reference to the yeah, yeah. very, very beginning. Yeah, go on. But, so, so here we go. So the question is, what does this have to do with proofs, right? Um, so this is a way to incentivize the prover to announce correct distributions, what this has to do with proofs and computation. So let me give you an example. And my, the example is accounting function. This example is exactly what's in the Azar Mikali paper. The input is an n bit vector z, and the output is the Hamming weight of the vector, meaning the number of bits that are one in z. So, the prover is just going to announce L prime and say, well, you know, I'm claiming that L prime is the Hammond weight of Z. Um, this is equivalent to announcing a distribution. So if, if the prover says the Hammond weight of uh, um, Z is 40% of N, this is basically telling me that the probability, uh, if I choose a randomly, a bit in Z is going to be one with probability L prime over N. So you can think of announcing this value as announcing a distribution. Well, then the real value also induces a real distribution, which is that if I choose a random bit in Z, it's going to be one with the real probability is going to be L over N, right? So there, and now we're back to the case in which there is a real distribution over the, the input, and the prover is announcing something that he claims, they claim to be the correct distribution. So how do we go then to verify? I'm gonna sample a single bit in the vector, and I'm going to compute the scoring rule, and I'm gonna reward the prover with that value. This is an incredibly efficient proof, right? Um, why? Because there's only one message from the prover to the verifier. There is no overhead whatsoever to compute this proof. The, the message from the prover, the prover is not proving anything, basically. The, mess, the prover is just computing the function and announcing what the value is. So it's one message, there is no overhead. And the verification requires sampling a single bit of the input and computing the function. And um, so the verifier, if this is like a massively long uh, vector, will only have to look at one location of the vector and doesn't have to read even the entire thing. So by just querying one location of the vector and computing this function, which in the Azar Mikali uh, paper is shown to be sublinear in the size of n, uh, the, the, um, the prover is incentivized to um, produce the right value. And this counting function, and I, 
So I went maybe really fast here, but this is... So Rosario, one question. So if the prover gives the right value, he's going to get paid the maximum, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. So the the scoring rule, the magic of the scoring rule is that if he, if he, in expectation uh, is that... Um, an expectation is going to be maximized if the prover says the truth, okay? So there is no proof. There's really no proof here. It's the, the incentive comes from the way the verifier um, pays the prover. And so this counting function generalizes, And in fact, it generalizes to larger counting functions. And in fact, one, this, this idea of one round rational proof this way can be used to prove Sharpie, uh, meaning the number of satisfying assignment in a, uh, a Boolean formula, which it's exactly the same idea. The prover announces how many satisfying assignments there are. The verifier picks a random a satisfying assignment, checks if it's satisfying or not. And you know the number of satisfying assignments induces a distribution on the assignments being satisfying or not. And so you have a scoring rule right there. And the other one is a little more uh, involved because it, 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 it involves um, recursing this counting function over, which is, you can think of it as a threshold gate. Um, so the gate says one or zero if the humming weight of the input vector is bigger or smaller than a certain threshold. And so it's enough to have the function that computes the humming weight to compute the, the threshold gate. And they, they're able to expand this idea to up to a constant level of C. So any circuit that has a constant depth of uh, this kind of counting threshold gates uh, can be proven the same way. And um, this one requires also a, a, just a sublinear verifier. So uh, when I saw the paper, I was really uh, fascinated. And at that time, Matteo was uh, one of my graduate students and we set off to, um, to read it and try to see what else we, we could do with that. And um, the first thing that we noticed was that there was a pretty substantial limitation with this adoption of scoring rules. And let me see if I can convey to you what the limitation is. So consider again the counting function, okay? So what is the, con the cost for the prover to compute this function? Um, well, the prover has to read all of the n bits in the vector, right? Because the prover has to figure out what the correct uh, hemming weight is. In the case of the threshold, um, you know, you may get to the result before, but in worst case, you have to read all the n bits. So, the, so I'm going to take my unit of cost to, to say how many memory locations I have to read. So obviously, it's going to cost n to compute it. On the other end, the prover could just try to cheat saying, hey, I'm going to pick a random value and I'm just going to tell you that's the Hamming weight, right? Well, the cost of this strategy is very, it's constant, right? I'm, I'm not reading the input at all and I'm just going to toss a random value out and tell you that's the Hamming weight. Well, we know that if the prover does that, it will earn less money, right? That will already know. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is that if we use the Breyer scoring rule for the reward, and here again, you're gonna have to trust me. And if you don't trust me, I can put you the, uh, I didn't wanna copy the whole math on the slides, but I have the, the paper ready and I can show you the paper. But, one interesting thing about the scoring rule is that the reward for the correct answer is always less than two in this particular case. In this particular case in which you have a uh, binary distribution in which probability one P and uh, a bit is one probability P and a bit is zero probability one minus P. 
Um, and turns out that the reward for a random answer, the strategy in which the prover just tells you something at random. So in this case, the expected reward is also, you take the expectations also on the, on the random choice of the prover, well, it's gonna be bigger than one. And then you can scale them up and down with any multiplier you want, but this is the ratio between what the prover is going to earn if it answers correctly and what the prover is going to earn if it answers at random, okay? And yes, the correct answer is gonna be higher for sure, but they're not that far away from each other. And in particularly, particularly they're not as, they're not as far away as the gap between the effort that the prover has to put into computing the correct functions versus the minimal effort that the prover has to do to output something at random. So the interesting thing about the scoring rule approach is that it's only focused on the reward. It's not focused on, it doesn't take into consideration the cost of having to compute the function. So if we define profit as the reward minus the cost, then if you up the right value, you're maximizing the reward, but you're not necessarily maximizing the profit. And the reason is that if I'm going to engage in many groups, say three, four, five, you know, at some point, the reward for the random answer is going to be, it, it, the total reward is gonna be always less, but the cost of always computing the right answer is going to start dominating and the profit of uh, uh, the random strategy is going to be higher. Okay, so there are two issues here. The first is that um, the reward doesn't scale with the amount of effort that it takes to actually compute the, the function correctly. And the second one is that you're gonna start seeing that if you're gonna start making a lot of proofs. So what we, what, what Matteo and I did, we sort of said, well, this is, uh, we have to sort of come up with a better definition. We call it composable. I'm still not sure that's the right uh, name for what we came up with. But we basically said, okay, say that the, the prover invests a, a certain amount, a certain amount of cost C prime into the computation. This is not the cost, the total cost, because if you in, in, invest in the total cost, you might as well compute the correct value, right? Then what I want is that the reward that he earns, the ratio between the rewards that he earned with the correct strategy and the real reward should always be smaller than the ratio between the effort that he invested versus the effort that is required to compute the, the, the function correctly. So we're coupling a lot more tightly the reward that the prover gets to the effort that the prover invests into the computation. And that is what you really need to have this, com this composition property, which if you're gonna do this a lot of times, there is no strategy that is going to get better than the honest one. But it's also where the, a lot of the complications come in because if, if, I'm, if the prover invests, if the prover just announces some, some result, it's very hard to estimate what a much effort he put for that particular strategy. So it's, it's, a, it's the correct definition conceptually, but it turned out to be a very challenging definition to work with because to come up with estimations for this value C prime of how much effort the prover invested turned out to be non-trivial. So this definition maximizes profit, not just reward, in the, preference, in the presence of repeated executions. 
So, um, and again, um, you can look at our paper to see this very simple example, um, um, but you can, uh, I think you can also ask me and I'll, I'll show you, but it's not that difficult to see. So, okay. So then Matteo and I say, okay, now we have a nice definition. What can we do? What can we compute with it, right? So in that paper and in a follow-up paper, the first one was, um, it was bounded depth fanning two circuits, but they needed to have some sort of regular structure. Um, and one example was the FFT circuit. And then a year later, we came up with um, a kind of nice idea about space bounded polynomial time functions. So in this case, the prover is computing a function that takes time t to compute and requires a most space s to be computed. And let me give you the example. Let me give you a very uh, simple description of how the protocol works. So if the prover, when the prover computes this function in time t and space s, you can think of it as the prover starts with an initial state s1 that contains the input, and then it applies a transition function, which is one computation step to get to the second state and so on. And this each state is the computation step. And then uh, at the very end, this is the last state which contains the output. Right? This could be the state of a Turing machine, if you want, and so on. And the state we know is bounded by S because we're assuming that it's a space bounded uh, polynomial time function. So, so the prover is going to announce the final state, okay? And is going to say, okay, I got to this state and I got to the state in the middle so I is really T over two. This was the state of the Turing machine when I got to the middle of the computation, okay? And the, the verifier is going to say, oh, okay, so you're claiming that this is the correct computation and you're telling me you came through this point. Okay, so I'm going to choose a random other to prove to me that this middle point is correct follows from S1, or I'm going to ask you a random uh, to prove to me that ST follows from this computation SI in T over two steps, either, in other case, in T over two steps. And so the verifier basically asks left or right, and the prover is going to recurse on either the left side of the computation or on the right side of the computation. And this is basically a binary search approach. Uh, nothing particularly fancy here. Um, at the end, we're going to end up with two states that are next to each other. And in this case, the verifier is going to check on their own that SI plus one can be legitimately obtained through the Turing machine transition function from SI. Okay? And if it does, the verifier accepts. If it doesn't, the verifier doesn't accept. And we, this protocol, first of all, has log t rounds of interaction uh, and the bandwidth of this protocol, because you have to sort of divide the computation in half every time. And the bandwidth of the computation is S log t, because at every step, at every round, the prover sends the entire state of the Turing machine, which we're assuming is bounded, right? So under a suitable bound on the space of the computation, you get an efficient error. And, uh, and then we can prove that this, and they'll come in a, in a minute, why this is rational according to our definition. But what really is nice about this um, um, Nicola, I'm going to tell you in a minute. That, that's a very good question. It comes up in the proof in a minute and you, you'll see what, there's a very crucial assumption in the proof and you're, you're zooming on it, so give me one second. So, but this is very similar to what some of those um, um, layer two uh, startups are doing to verify the 
off chain the correctness of certain computations. Okay. Um, so okay, so I'm writing the the, the protocol again, um, and so and here are the questions that come up, right? Why is this a rational approach? Why is this true? true? Well, the proof of is based on a kind of a strong assumption. So let's let's let, let, let's think about it. The goal of the prover is to pass the verification, to make the verifier accept by investing less computation than it would take to compute the whole function. And let me give you here a very simple way in which the prover can actually do that. So the very, and this is exactly what Nicholas was saying, Nicolai was saying, is I'm going to say left or right. And at this point, the prover has not invested anything. And so the prover is going to say, is going to compute half of the computation and somehow make sure that everything that comes later is correct, okay? And so it, this really, there is an adaptive strategy in which the prover can as a budget of cost that is less than the entire cost of the computation, and he can allocate that cost somewhere in the computation and being able to make the verifier accept um, even um, without, uh, without having done the entire computation. Remember, my goal is that if the verifier accept, the prover has to have done the entire computation. If the prover does less than less computation, the probability that I'm going to give him a reward, because in this case, the reward is, is either zero or is the total reward, right? If I accept, I pay. If I don't accept, I pay zero. So in this case, it really, this definition right here, let me go back to the definition. This definition right here says, remember that, you're, you're either going to get R or you're going to get zero. And so if you get R, the probability that you get R should be basically um, the fraction of the cost that you, that you invested. But with this adaptive strategy, that's not necessarily the case, okay? So what we are assuming is that whatever the, the prover did to this computation, he's done it before the protocol starts some sort of a non-adaptive strategy. And that's kind of a weird assumption to make, but in reality, there are ways in which you can actually enforce it. You can use some sort of timing assumption. If I ask you the questions really repeatedly and fast, and I say, show me left, show me right, show me left, and I'm not gonna accept if you give me the answer right away, you want to have time to somehow on the fly, go and do the computation that you need to do to to, to convince me, okay? So you can force the prover to be non-adaptive by using timing assumptions. And when I came to, to PL, this, this really, this really uh, rang a bell when uh, somebody explained to me that we do proofs on, on the, um, on the committed space by on a on a pretty fast pace or at least fast enough to prevent the prover to do certain amount of computation that would allow the prover not to um, keep the data stored right in in Falcon the, the prover as a as a and I'll get to that later in, in one of my, my last slides the prover can either keep the data stored or could recompute the encoding that uh, is stored and don't, don't store anything, just store the seed of the encoding. I recompute it on the fly when I ask, can you show me that you're still computing, uh, storing this encoding? But the time to compute that encoding, it, it, it's too long if I ask. So I, I time my checks uh, at, a, at a rate that is faster than um, the amount of time that it would take him to compute the encoding. And this is something similar that we're doing here. I'm going to ask these checks at a, at a rate that is faster 
that it take the prover to allocate its computation budget in a way adaptively based on my question. And I don't know if this answer Nicolas' concern, but that is the concern with this approach. And again, for me, that that in, the, the theoretician in me looked at that almost like a hack and something that I was not happy with, right? So it would be nice to have a proof that this protocol is, or some other protocol is rational without having to use this kind of assumptions. So, so this kind of um, tells you a little bit about how people started thinking about rational proofs, some of the limitations, some of the ways we can try to uh, overcome some of these limitations. At the same time, um, a team led by Alain Rosen started looking at the notion of rational arguments. So what are rational arguments? Remember the difference between proofs and arguments, right? Uh, proofs, the prover is uh, computationally bounded. Uh, sorry, proofs, the prover is all powerful. Arguments, the prover is computationally bounded. So they're saying the model introduced by Azar and Mikali assumes an all-powerful prover, but in reality, we can also assume that the prover is computationally uh, bounded, right? So the prover is both rational and computationally bounded. And what they can do with that is a one-round rational proof for all, for any polynomial time computation with sublinear verification. Remember that everything we showed you so far didn't cover all of P, right? And um, so the, the tools is a rational proof for a weaker complexity class, which is bootstrapped to all of the P, to all of P for cryptography, okay? And that's where the argument comes in. And know that we already know how to do this via snarks. So why do we care about the proof being rational? Well, it turns out that if you do it this way, you have weaker computational and set up assumptions than what you need to do snarks. Um, but, for the, but when, when they came up with this, Matteo and I started thinking that at, at, at this problem as traditional crypto might be an overkill, right? Why? Assuming that the prover is proving a computation of the takes time t, now I'm assuming that the prover uh, to cheat would have to solve an exponential time problem, which is the cryptography problem. But in reality is why would it rationally invest more than t time to try to cheat? So what that really seems to us is that rationality implies that we can only need to protect against cheating strategies that take more time than P. And this is something that Matteo and I so start looking at. Can we build computation where if what we're proving takes cost C, any cheating strategy must take more than C. And so, and then if the, the, the reward is maximized when the verifier accepts, then the rational strategy is to do the computation correctly because that is the one with the minimum cost. So we have a partial answer for that in, in a paper in which we come up with, um, and again, the tool is to build an information theoretic proofs under the idealized Oracle condition and then use what we call fine-grained cryptography to implement the Oracle. Um, in our case, cost is power of complexity, circuit depth, and let me skip the technicality. But what is fine-grained cryptography? Um, fine-grained cryptography is crypto that is secure, not against super polynomial adversary, but against large polynomial adversary. In our case, it would be whatever cost you need to break the computation, something bigger than the computation that I'm making. So, and hopefully we can build something like this and there's much weaker computational assumption than one way function. So fine grained crypto is not new. We have the original Merkle proposal for public key encryption is something in which if two honest parties communicate investing cost C, the adversary can break the communication investing time C squared. So it's not that it's super polynomial to break it, it's just much, much larger than the cost of computing the and it has appeared time and again in the crypto literature, uh, including you know, proof of work consensus is basically based on some sort of fine grained crypto. You can do it, but it takes a lot of time to do it. So the recent developments are this work by, uh, I don't remember the authors, one is Binon, 
this public key encryption, which is secure against uh, uh, log depth circuits, induces very mild complexity assumptions, what we cryptographers refer as mini crypt. And this is exactly what Matteo and I used. Uh, we had to improve it. We had to make it all more fair uh, to make to use in our proof. And our proofs is for adversary than C1. Um, but then there's this very exciting work by uh, Ball and all that, um, that said that they, they come up with some computational problems that have size n and uh, have um, average case complexity, which is bigger than n. Let me, and I should probably, I don't know, I have time, but it's a very interesting problem. If you think of it, you, this is one example, there are several of them. So, say that you have two sets of n vectors and you want to find out if any pair is orthogonal. Well, it turns out that there's, you know, an obvious attempt to try all possible pairs until you see if there is one uh, that it's orthogonal. Doing that with less than using all possible pairs turns out to be impossible if we believe, in the worst case, that three sat can only be solved uh, in exponential time. So it's a very interesting connection between finding uh, solving a quadratic problem versus solving an exponential problem. This was actually a pretty celebrated result by Ryan Williams. Um, what they did, which was very interesting, they show that the worst case hardness of this problem also implies the average case hardness of this problem. And average case hardness was we need to do crypto. And so this was the first step towards building something that could be used as cryptography, and here's the, the, basic, the basic idea is right here. You know, all our snarks and our proofs are built using an information theoretic paradigm that has some restriction, and then using cryptography to instantiate that restriction. And if we instantiate those restrictions via fine-grained cryptography, we would get exactly the uh, something of the equivalent of Merkle puzzles. If the prover has to invest time C, cost C to compute a function, any cheating strategy would have to be bigger than C. And that would give you rationality for free. Okay? And the questions are, how can we do this in the case? We know how to do it for, for NC1, but what about sequential time, which is a very interesting case. And it sort of boils down to the question of what is a rational commitment? How can I commit to a data and then be rationally incentivized to open the correct data rather than being cryptographically bound to open the right data? I'll skip the slide. Uh, a lot of you know about proof of space time. Um, so I'm gonna um, just say that a lot of the checks in in the proof of space time, we're using cryptographically strong snarks, but in reality, those, those are not necessary. A fine grained security based, oh, you know what, to pass the verification, you have to put more space in the system than what actually you're already committing. It wouldn't be worth for the miner to do so. You would just, so we, it, the system would still work is instead of using cryptographically strong snarks, use fine-grained snarks based on the amount of space that it requires to pass the verification. And so, sorry to, for running out of time, but the, the conclusion is that rational proofs can be used as alternatives to computationally sound arguments in many scenarios. And the hope is that we could do this with better efficiency than cryptographic proofs and weaker computational assumptions. And right now, in my mind, the most promising direction is to use this average um, case complexity uh, results in the fine-grained setting to build actual cryptographic schemes. We have very little, and um, I think that would be a very exciting area to work at. And I'm done. So sorry to run a little fast in the, in the end, but basically the idea is can we prove computations in a way that cheating takes more than time than doing the right thing. So, and we know how to do that in very 
few specific cases and not in general. Rosario, thank you for that yeah. and no need to apologize. Do you have time for questions yeah, that you yeah, mentioned? Yeah. Okay, um, so if there are questions, uh, please uh, just feel free to pop in and ask them. If you do uh, wanna say off the recording, go ahead and type them in the chat and we can read them out. I may have a question. I'm yeah. not very familiar with this fine grain cryptography and I'm curious to know if there are already some computational assumptions associated with this kind of uh, setting right. so the there are two right so the oh no, i mean so, so all we know is in terms of fine-grained crypto really all we know is this scheme by Vinod and some of his students where they build this uh encryption scheme which is secure against adversary which are nc1 circuits okay so log that circuit. Oh, okay uh, the complexity assumption is that NC1 is not contained in else poly. Matteo, correct me if I'm wrong. But it's a very mild complexity assumption. It's actually even weaker than the existence of one-way functions. So it's actually even less than mini-crypt, if I, if I remember correctly. So you could have, so say that uh, there are no one-way functions. You could still be do, you could still be able to do this. There's a world in which you cannot do any cryptography, but you you mm -hmm. could do. This. I see. Okay. So, so that's the one thing, and this one, this one is is also interesting because the average case complexity of this orthogonal vector problem is based on the worst case complexity, which in turn is based on the strong exponential time. So the strong exponential time hypothesis does imply that P is different than NP, but it doesn't necessarily imply that public cryptography exists, right? Um, but if we were able to build a one-way function, a quote-unquote fine-grained one-way function out of this, which they don't know how to do, by the way, um, then we would have, again, like in the other case, we would have uh, something that exist in this fine-grained setting, even if no super polynomial time of uh, one-way function exists. So, uh, right? So, yeah, so there are going to be assumptions, but, um, and that's why what, what I said um, here, is that maybe we'll get computational. So there are two sides of this in, in my mind, why we should be looking at this. The first one is that the theoret this is a theoretical one. Can we do this with weaker computational assumptions? And this is the practical one. Maybe by looking at uh, rationality instead of looking at uh, cryptographically strong proofs, we can get better efficiency. So, okay. Oh, we have a, I'm not sure if this is a question to be answered or not. It says- uh, It's Matteo that is keeping me honest. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, rational arguments and proofs can be a more interesting solution whenever we cannot well, analyze yeah, cheaters. Was, yeah, the second is a question. Um, yeah, well, let, uh, let me finish reading it just for folks watching the recording here. So um, it can be a more interesting solution whenever we cannot penalize cheaters or we cannot afford a big deposits. You know where this assumption is true nowadays or more true. So, okay, so what Matteo is saying is, you know, rational proofs work in a system in which you have this ability to penalize or to reward so, and a lot of the blockchain applications have this kind of uh, settings. Uh, for other settings, uh, no, we, we don't have those, uh, those situations. And then, yes, you, you better go back to your cryptographical sound uh, proofs where cheating is absolutely impossible. If you, or, you know, impossible, computational impossible, right? Um, if you have a setting, and that's, you know, that's why I said uh, in many scenarios, right? Um, if you have a settings where you can introduce this utility function, then using cryptography might be an overkill and you may end up with, uh, uh, with something better 
Although at this point we don't know uh, of anything like substantially better than. Uh, um, than Rosario, I'd like to clarify my my question. Maybe yeah. it, the Bell and Q and others, for example, they they have these punishments and, yeah. and bounties, right? But that requires that there's a there's a more complex system of deposits and such. And sometimes I don't remember if that's the paper, but there's a paper we compare to and we show that uh, then negative punishment should be too high. And so rational, yeah. racially composable arguments, proofs are, are better in that sense. Right. Now, but you still need some type of expert. Like if you have deposits, then you can you can afford to use other uh, more intuitive systems. And, and I was wondering in practice, right? What, yeah, I don't know. I mean, in practice, in 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 the in the in a lot of the blockchain applications, you do have the ability to ask people to, to commit to a deposit, to commit to a sort of uh, uh, penalty in case something goes wrong, right? And and right now, a lot of that is used to do. By the way, rationality is very deeply connect to another. Um, area of multi-party computation, which is this cover model, right? In which um, we, you, if you detect cheating, it's possible to cheat and you possibly, but you don't only detect it with non-eligible probability, but you get a mere substantial probability also to pass. But if you make a big enough penalty for when I catch you, then you're not incentivized to do it. So, um, so it definitely seems like that's something that you are you you wanna wanna have in place. Uh, so, and those are where you know the, the, the these techniques could actually help. But you know, the, you you see that with the proofs where you choose the security parameter very low for efficiency reason, right? So your soundness is one tenth. Uh, that means that I can cheat with probability nine ten, but if the payment that I have to for that one in ten cases in which I get caught is pretty high, I'm not going to do it. So yeah. Thank you for joining, everyone. If you have suggestions for a future speaker or if you'd like to present your own research, please email us at research@protocol.ai. Please remember to like and subscribe and sign up for our mailing list in the link below. Thanks for joining. Uh, we'll see you next time.